I'm the president and CEO of Joint Venture Silicon Valley, and I have the privilege of welcoming you to this uh, program today. We're very grateful that uh, we can be here at Microsoft. Uh, the corporation is extremely generous to us and to the community. We appreciate their generosity and their hospitality. And I want you to meet, first off, a representative of Microsoft. Her name is Bridget Steele, and she's going to welcome us to their expanding campus. Bridget, please. and I just want to welcome you back. We've been uh, fortunate enough to host you in the past and we hope to host you in the future. I apologize for the construction, but uh, we're just expanding our space and we want to make it more welcoming to all visitors. Um, just a couple of housekeeping. Every seat has power, so if you want to plug in, you know, we encourage you to do that, to stay connected throughout the day. If you feel like tweeting out, Microsoft SV is our Twitter handle. And um, if you need to use the restroom, they're just outside the door here, so uh, we have some security people who can escort you. I understand your main presentations and panels will be in here, and your meals next door. So I uh, wish you a great event. If you have any questions, let us know. We have a couple of Microsoft representatives in the audience as well. But again, thank you, and uh, we appreciate the dialogue, and hopefully some great solutions coming out of today. Thank you. Well, we're eager to begin, and I know that uh, you want to plunge right in, but my role is to welcome you to put the day into some context. And so we're going to start first with a big picture, which is to tell you about Joint Venture itself, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, and why it is that an organization like ours would be convening a proceeding like this one. The organization brings together Silicon Valley's leaders across all of the major sectors. So Joint Venture is an organization that brings together uh, elected officials, city managers, public sector officials. It pairs them with CEOs and senior business leaders and then adds to that mix the college and university presidents and uh, heads of major foundations, even labor and workforce leaders, a host of others. They all come together in this framework that Joint Venture provides. And our mission is the health and vitality of Silicon Valley as a region. Our premise is that Silicon Valley is a very special place, and yet we believe that we shouldn't take uh, any of our advantages for granted, that we should view them as something that require uh, special care and keeping. And so the mission of Joint Venture is to think strategically about our region, its long-term needs, how we can continue to be a place that uh, is uh, a fabulous place for building a company, growing a company, raising a family, all of those things. So you'll find Joint Venture actually working on a host of problems. We're working on anything that affects the region's vitality and competitiveness, everything from tax and fiscal issues to urban planning and design, education, communications, infrastructure, uh, regional governance issues. We're working on all of those things. But uh, several years ago, we also prioritized climate change and uh, our nation's critical need to think more uh, strategically about energy, our energy use, its usage, its generation. The hope was that Silicon Valley could be a leader and a pioneer, a place that does in fact lead uh, our nation to a new energy future. So we have uh, rolled out a whole portfolio of activities that are focused squarely on these issues, energy issues. And perhaps throughout the day, you'll be hearing about them in detail. Uh, many of them are focused right now on special zone right here, uh, the, the vicinity uh, adjacent to Moffett Field. We're trying to develop uh, in this special zone uh, something that we're calling the Smart Energy Enterprise Development Zone. Uh, we hope that someday it will truly be the nation's most fully integrated smart grid and a real showcase for um, new ways to use and um, monitor, engage, and also generate uh, energy. So that's why Joint Venture has gathered you today. Now what we learned early on is that uh, though we care about energy and all of its many facets, storage is a particularly crucial issue. It infuses everything. It's, um, it laces through all of the questions uh, that we would ask. And so uh, we definitely care about storage, especially because there's so much hope being placed in renewable sources of energy. And they have, as you well know, this intermittency to them. And so we really do need to think more creatively about the way um, 
we store it. We also care about storage because obviously it will put um, the power exactly where we need it um, and therefore match supply and demand in new and exciting ways. And um, we think that's important and we hope that Silicon Valley can somehow be at the forefront of this. It's always been interesting to me. Um, Silicon Valley is a place that has learned to do amazing things with electrons, right? Uh, we can make those electrons dance and just do things that have changed the world as we know it. What we haven't figured out yet entirely yet is how to store these things, how to actually store them. And uh, the hope is that really Silicon Valley can be a leader. And this is, of course, your area of expertise and not mine. And so uh, I mostly want to salute you for the crucial role that you'll be playing in these developments that really will be game-changing, life-changing over the coming decades. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being here. The last thing I'll say is that we've learned that uh, as we think about storage more expansively, that uh, policy issues are really at the forefront. Uh, they, they're clearly as important as the technology itself and as pricing itself. Uh, these policy issues are just absolutely crucial. And in fact, there may be many policy issues, as you'll discuss today, that are standing in the way. And so it's our hope today especially that we can talk about that in a candid and robust way. And it's our hope that Silicon Valley can be a place that is driving those policy questions and is, in fact, a place for policy, uh, not only decisions, but policy innovation. So hopefully that sets the context for everything that you're going to be uh, doing today. Uh, now I want to introduce uh, the most important person in your life today, and that is Rachel Massaro. She is Joint Ventures Vice President. She has uh, many responsibilities, but uh, she spends uh, full, fully half of her time working on energy issues and our climate initiatives. And um, she will be your guide today, the MC. She will be uh, um, uh, taking you through all of the proceedings as they unfold. And I just want you to know that, uh, that uh, this gathering has uh, been under her supervision and her hard work as president of the organization. I'm deeply appreciative of that. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please now welcome to the stage uh, Rachel Massaro. Thank you very much, Russ, for that wonderful introduction and, um, and context for our event today. Um, as Russ said, my name is Rachel Massaro, and I'm Vice President at Joint Venture Silicon Valley. I want to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I know that all of you have certainly seen my emails about this event, uh, and I've talked to a lot of you personally, um, and it's great to see the familiar faces in the audience here. It's also really great to see all the unfamiliar faces uh, here. Uh, to those of you who are new to the symposium, uh, we're really glad that you're here and part of this exciting annual event. I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what the event is about and why we've been doing it from year to year. Uh, as Russ mentioned briefly, um, Joint Venture cares about energy storage and I assume that all of you do too. Um, that's why you're here today. Um, I'm sure you all realize though that there are energy storage conferences out there across the country. There might even be occasional, energy, occasional other energy storage conferences held here locally. Uh, but I want to be pretty clear here about what makes this event different and why we've been holding it on an annual basis for uh, now four years. First of all, this is most definitely not a technical conference on energy storage. We have in the past highlighted some things about energy storage technologies, but mostly in the context of uh, those technologies applications and uh, local pilot projects. Also, this event is not just for energy storage experts, although we do have plenty of energy storage experts here in the room today. It's really intended for all of Silicon Valley's clean tech stakeholders to come together to talk about energy storage, um, what's happening in the energy storage industry, and as an annual event, to be examining on a year-to-year -year basis what's happened in the last year, how, how far have we come, um, and what's happening next. Every year we invite someone that will share with us the national perspective on energy storage. This year we have Assistant Secretary Patricia Hoffman from the DOE as well as FERC Chairman Wellinghoff. And then we also include speakers who can talk about what's happening on, on the state level in California. Then we focus in on what's happening locally. Um, we highlight uh, energy storage pilot projects and as you'll see on this year's agenda, 
we have a whole section this afternoon dedicated to local initiatives around energy storage. So with all of that said, uh, we are starting the day off with, an, with a very important topic, what's going on at the major energy agencies and how they're coordinating around energy storage. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our panelists to come up on stage. This panel will be moderated by Brian Orion from Lawyers for Clean Energy, who is going to introduce the speakers to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rachel, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be uh, on the stage uh, here today, and I want to um, introduce our panel. Uh, this is panel one, and the topic of the panel is interagency coordination on energy storage policy. As Rachel mentioned, my name is Brian O'Ryan. I'm an attorney uh, with an energy law practice in San Francisco called Lawyers for Clean Energy, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, and just to set up the topic as we uh, envisioned it, um, the, the inspiration was really that uh, Energy storage and the electricity system in general is, is increasingly a place of, of policy innovation and greater and greater complexity, as, especially as we look to what are really some fairly profound changes with integration of renewable energy, uh, integration of increasing distributed generation, and a lot of other policies that are taking root now uh, which are uh, really driving a lot of fairly significant change. And um, that is really nowhere more true than in storage, insofar as storage really touches so many different uh, areas of the grid. It's such a flexible resource, so many potential uses and applications uh, that uh, it, it really implicates and touches on a lot of different jurisdiction and a lot of different uh, agency action and policy making. So, uh, Given that this is an energy storage conference, we thought it would be most appropriate to bring together uh, leaders from a number of those agencies uh, so that they could uh, educate us as an audience about what's going on because gosh knows it's, it's hard to keep track of, of what's happening uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis because it changes so frequently. Um, and also uh, to share information, so to kind of allow everyone to be together to kind of uh, share best practices and learn from each other. And it, it, in part, I think, just symbolically to demonstrate that this is a shared endeavor uh, with shared purpose and that hopefully we are all in this together working uh, for a common goal, which is uh, to improve our grid and uh, through the deployment of energy storage. Uh, so with that, we're honored to have a, such a distinguished panel. Uh, I, th I think it's interesting, all three of the speakers could probably have, you know, led the marquee and keynote this, this conference today, so it's really a, pl a privilege to have them all together here on stage. Uh, I'm going to start with an introduction, and then we'll jump into a question-type uh, discussion, and we'll leave time at the end for questions, so if things come to mind, uh, we'll have time for those questions at the end. So uh, on my immediate left is Chairman John Wellinghoff. John Wellinghoff was named Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulato Regulatory Commission, FERC, uh, by President Obama on March 19, 2009. Uh, first appointed as a commissioner to FERC in 2006, Chairman Wellinghoff is an energy law attorney with 37 years experience in regulatory, consumer, and commercial law. Before joining FERC, he was in private practice focusing primarily on renewable energy, distributed resources, and energy policy. He served two terms as the state of Nevada's first consumer advocate for customers of public utilities and authored the first comprehensive state utility integrated planning statute. He also was the primary author of the Nevada Renewable Portfolio Standard Act. Chairman Wellinghoff's priorities at FERC include instituting policies and practices to create more robust and efficient wholesale electric markets by enabling renewable resources and distributed resources such as demand response, energy efficiency, and as relevant today, local storage systems uh, to fully participate in those markets. 
He holds a Juris Doctorate from Antioch School of Law, a Master's of Arts in Teaching from Howard University, and a BS in Mathematics from the University of Nevada, Reno. And uh, next to stage left, I guess you're right, <laughs> uh, is Karen Edson. A 30-year veteran of public affairs and policy, Karen Edson is the Vice President, Policy and Client Services for the California Independent System Operator Corporation, California ISO. She joined the organization in 2005 and has responsibility for the areas of customer service and industry affairs, government regulatory affairs, communications, and policy development. Prior to joining the ISO, Ms. Edson served in a number of senior roles within state government, including Commissioner on the California Energy Commission and Assistant Director of the California Research Bureau. From 1985 to 2000, she headed a small consulting firm that specialized in energy policy development and power plant permitting, with clients that included major geothermal and other non-utility power plant developers. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley. And finally, Carla Peterman. Carla Peterman is a commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission. She was appointed by Governor Brown in December of last year. She came to the CPUC from her role as a commissioner at the California Energy Commission, where she served from 2011 to 2012. Commissioner Peterman has conducted research at the University of California Energy Institute at Haas since 2006 and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory from 2008 to 2010. She was an environmental business analyst with a community development nonprofit from 2004 to 2005, and was an associate focused on energy financing in the investment banking division of Lehman Brothers from 2002 to 2004. Commissioner Peterman also served on the board of directors for the Utility Reform Network from 2008 to 2011. Commissioner Peterman will complete her doctoral studies this year, is that correct? That okay. is correct, hopefully. <laughs> in, in energy and resources at the University of California, Berkeley. Commissioner Peterman holds a BA in history from Howard University, and an MS in environmental change and management, and MBA from Oxford University, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. So please join me in welcoming the panelists. With that introduction, I want to start out with the, with the discussion. Uh, and to approach this topic and provide some background that will hopefully be useful to frame up the entirety of today's events, um, I want to ask an overview question to start. Uh, this has two parts. Uh, the first is, in high-level terms, uh, I'd like to ask the speakers to describe the scope of your agency's authority as it touches energy storage. And secondly, uh, to provide us with an update on status of uh, the status of efforts underway at each of your agencies to implement energy storage within your particular role in the process. I get to go first, Brian? Yeah, let's just go ahead and go down the line. Thanks. Right. Th thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Well, for those of you who don't know uh, about FERC much, let me, let me give you a quick background and then we'll go into the storage context. But FERC's work in, in regulating the wholesale electric markets revolves around ensuring that those markets are efficient, fair, and competitive. Uh, for the past several decades, FERC has emphasized a market-based approach to regulating power trades. If the seller can demonstrate that it does not have market power, FERC generally allows willing buyers and sellers to strike their own deals. And while transmission remains a regulated monopoly, the majority of electric consumers in FERC-regulated states are served by RTOs and ISOs, where the transmission provider and the market operator are the same entity, independent from market participants. In non-RTO states where power is traded in bilateral markets, FERC's focus has largely been in on ensuring open access to transmission grid to ensure that resources can be delivered into the market. Now FERC's approach on all technologies that can provide market services is generally the same, and that is, is there something in FERC's rules that is acting as a barrier to the market selecting the most economic resource. We're not an agency that funds technologies. We also don't regulate the procurement decisions by utilities. We regulate the terms and conditions of wholesale power sales and the transmission of electricity in interstate commerce. We leave it to the buyers and sellers to determine whether to provide 
or take service from storage facilities. We work to ensure that all resources are given a reasonable opportunity to participate in the wholesale markets, a market in which a variety of resources compete against each other to meet the supply needs of consumers. This means we tend to focus on the nuts and bolts of market operations. So with that said, we have given thought in recent years as to how storage can or might participate in wholesale electric markets. So back in 2010, FERC requested comments on how the wholesale markets may be creating barriers, barriers to energy storage, and we asked a number of questions. Among those were, when can a storage provider be classified and receive compensation as a transmission asset? Should a storage project be permitted to receive compensation as transmission and also receive compensation for enhancing the value of generation or providing ancillary services? Do FERC's pricing policies for ancillary services create undue barriers to energy storage? Would a standalone contract storage service make sense, similar to the way that natural gas storage is marketed? Does FERC need to update its accounting and reporting requirements to facilitate cost of service rate making for new storage technologies? These questions all relate to the ultimate question, that is, what is the business case for electric storage in wholesale energy markets? How can FERC structure market rules to enable this multi-dimensional technology and provide storage developers with distributed opportunities for their storage assets? In essence, how to stack revenues from storage applications? In part, those questions arise because of the underlying structure of the wholesale electric markets. As you all know, storage facilities can function in a number of ways, provide nearly instantaneous balancing service, arbitrage energy prices across different time periods, smooth output from the variable generation such as wind and solar, defer the need for transmission or distribution upgrades, and the list goes on. In fact, in 2010, Sandia Labs did a study that identified 17 distinct applications for storage devices. In vertically integrated utility, the utility can capture various value streams associated with each of these applications. Deferred transmission costs can be realized at the same time utility uses storage facility to maximize the value of its generation fleet and balance the moment to moment fluctuations of the grid. But in wholesale markets, these functions become associated with discrete products and services, energy capacity, a particular entry service or transmission. This, is, this unbundling of products in the wholesale markets can be a challenge for storage developers needing access to all potential revenue streams in order to be economic. In response to our request for comments and an, out, and an outreach to the industry, companies have raised the issue of the fragmented revenue streams, but it seems no real solutions have yet emerged. Instead, we've got more concrete suggestions regarding our pricing policies, market rules, and accounting regulations. So to date, FERC has, FERC has focused on these topics, seeking to implement reforms that level the playing field within the market as they exist. <coughs> and one of the most significant actions that FERC has taken was to require RTOs and ISOs to pay for frequency regulation service based upon the speed and accuracy of the resource being used, our, our order 7, 7, 755. Regulation service is that moment-by-moment -moment balancing of the system. RTOs and ISOs require regulation service through competitive bidding mechanisms. As newer technologies started to provide regulation service, the RTOs and ISO markets, in those markets it became clear that fast responding resources like storage were often being asked to address a disproportionate share of the regulation needs. So FERC changed the way that RTOs and ISOs pay rates for regulation service, tying compensation to accuracy and speed allowing resources that are most effective at following frequency deviation signals to provide that service and freeing up other slower resources for other services. Most of the RTOs have implemented these pricing changes, although some continue to work on market rules or software necessary to comply with FERC's regulation. And in those markets that have implemented this change, we're seeing increased numbers of storage facilities being deployed. Outside of the RTO markets, Regulation services provided by transmission providers, many of which are vertically integrated utilities. Pricing is generally based on the embedded price of the slice of system resources used to provide regulation service. Under FERC transmission policies, regulation service can be purchased from a transmission provider or can be self-supplied. However, there isn't a lot of clarity regarding how a customer might self-supply regulation service from, for example, a battery. 
FERC also proposed to increase transparency in regulation service pricing to make it easier, easier for customers to self-supply from alternative resources such as batteries. Taking the principles of Order 755 and applying them in bilateral market context, transmission providers would be required to show how they determine regulation service requirements, taking into account speed and accuracy of the resource being used. On a related issue, FERC is also exploring changes to its pricing policy for entry services sold to a transmission provider. Outside of the RTO markets, transmission providers are the dominant buyers of capacity used to provide ancillary services such as regulation and imbalance service. However, FERC has placed limitations on the sale to transmission providers to mitigate concerns of potential market power. FERC's concerns have been that the seller with market power may be able to charge excessive rates to that to, the, uh, to end up uh, getting passed on by the transmission provider to its captive customers. We have a pending rulemaking where we're exploring alternative rate-making policies to limit the potential for market power while enhancing the ability to make sales to transmission providers. So we continue to work hope, through the details, but hopefully we, hopefully we can have something productive in this area shortly. Some storage developers have sought clarity from FERC regarding the potential to cover costs of a storage facility in transmission rates. FERC has addressed this question in several orders. Most recently, in 2010, in an order involving Western Grid, a developer proposing to use a storage device to address voltage issues and line overloads within the California ISO. FERC agreed that a storage facility in that order could qualify as a transmission facility eligible for a transmission rate treatment if the project were selected by the ISO as an appropriate solution and if the project were operated as a transmission asset. But that later qualification, uh, operation as a transmission asset, can be prob problematic for some storage developers. Returning to the issue of fragmented revenue streams, it may be most efficient to use a storage facility for a range of applications, not limited to a transmission function. Yet the way FERC's rate policies are set up, it's difficult to operate in both the cost-based transmission environment and the market-based energy environment. Similarly, FERC has focused in recent years on working on transmission planning reforms which have been, a, have been announced in our orders 890 and 1000. In those orders, FERC has required a comparable consideration of non-transmission alternatives in the regional plan, uh, planning process. But again, there is no rate mechanism other than the transmission rate base for the cost of non-transmission alternatives such as storage to be recovered. So what could the future hold? Well, first there's a potential for participation in RTO capacity markets. Capacity markets provide revenue certainty for resources that clear in annual auctions. In New York, for example, resources are bought on a one-year look ahead. In New York and New England, there's a uh, one-year capacity market delivery delivered for three years out. But often, the value of many storage applications isn't in the megawatt volume of capacity of the particular facility, but it, in its speed and flexibility. Forward capacity markets aren't designed to compensate for that value, instead are largely focused on acquiring the necessary volume of capacity to meet reserves. So how about forward capacity markets for ancillary services? This could be a blend of the performance-based payment concepts in Order 755 and the forward contracting mechanisms in the capacity market. We've done some thinking on forward ancillary services market, what it might look like, but we haven't identified a need to move forward on the idea from a regulatory perspective yet. We don't have a record of the existing, from an existing RTO capacity market where it would be unjust and unreasonable without uh, forward procurement of ancillary services capacity. And also, not our, all RTOs have capacity markets, so any expansion to include ancillary services will only be relevant for some markets. Some RTOs are considering how their capacity markets might evolve to address future ancillary services needs, particular as to the need for flexibility in, uh, is increasing. We're following the developments and looking forward to those proposals. Finally, we wonder <clears throat> if it would be possible to design a cost of service rate, rate mechanism that blends market-based rate opportunities. This would allow a project to include a rate base such as a transmission function proposed by Western Grid while also allowing the project to bid into energy or ancillary services market when not needed to support transmission service. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we haven't exactly figured out how that would work yet. It's a sort of, you know, future regulation that we're looking at. So we still recognize there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I've been addressing these uh, energy storage issues 
and try to address them as effectively and efficiently as possible. But I encourage all of you to bring forward your ideas. Uh, the ISO, uh, certainly we get ideas from the ISOs and RTOs around the country as well. And together I think we can formulate good policies and make good, good business cases for storage to be an integral part of our markets. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a quick follow-up, uh, Chairman. Uh, in reading Order 755 and, and hearing your remarks just now, um, you mentioned that faster responding uh, resources like storage uh, were being asked to do more work in the capacity markets. And it's a bit of a technical question, but I was curious, what, why is that exactly? Well, they do more work in essence by being able to respond faster to the signal that the grid operator provides to them. In other words, by providing that faster response, they can catch the curve quicker and they can, in essence, slow down or dampen better the variations or variability in the overall operation of the system. So they work harder, but under 755, they get paid more as well. That's, that's the good part. They get paid for the actual work they do. And that was the, that was the, the main uh, essence of 755. It gave them the compensation for the actual value that something like storage could bring, uh, fast response storage could bring to the market. Thank you. And uh, to Ms. Edson, uh, again, we're, we're, we're talking about kind of, since each agency has a distinct, uh, although related, function uh, to play in bringing this flexible resource online, asking each speaker to address in what uh, way does your agency touch on storage and what are you doing within your agency to help implement it? Uh, thank you, Brian, and, and thank you to the joint venture for including the ISO in this panel today. Our CEO was here last year, um, could not make it this year, unfortunately, so you have me instead. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is just give you a quick overview of the ISO for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with it. Uh, then touch on our current activities and, and then describe the challenge that we see that goes to the uh, kind of foundation Chairman Wellinghoff just laid about the changing nature of, of load and the flexibility needs on the system. So the California ISO um, is a, a, a public benefit nonprofit corporation. Uh, we are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, and we're responsible for reliable operation of a, a little more than 80% of the system here in California with a small little piece of uh, southwestern Nevada. Um, we use software to redispatch our system every five minutes to optimize operations, taking into account market bids from generators and transmission, con and, and tran transmission congestion on the system. We use automatic generation control to match load and resources every four seconds. Our markets clear a little over $8 billion per year. In addition, uh, we manage the uh, interconnections to the high voltage transmission system and plan for its expansion based on reliability needs, policy objectives of the state, and economic benefits to ratepayers. Now, we're, we're, um, with regard to storage and specific initiatives, we have a number uh, of efforts underway and some, some ready for deployment um, uh, in response to uh, the leadership that FERC has provided. Um, for example, we've deployed a non-generation model to allow resources to operate from positive to negative to positive as storage can do. It's a model that yeah, wasn't otherwise considered um, in our systems that we now have in place and available. Um, we're about to deploy our pay for performance model pursuant to Order 755, which will compensate resources with a regulation capacity payment plus a mileage payment for their response to dispatch instructions, including the accuracy of that response. We're in market simulation now, and uh, deployment will occur over the next uh, few months. We also um, have a flexible ramping constraint in our model today that ensures we have enough flexible resources available in the event of a significant unplanned loss or increase in wind or solar production. That constraint will be converted into a, uh, from a market constraint to a system constraint to a full market product uh, next year. So those are a number of things underway now to start to try to address these, this fragmented revenue stream issue that storage faces, which as Chairman Wellinghoff has noted is really um, one of the fundamental challenges um, this industry faces. 
we do con we can consider storage options in our transmission planning process, but again, it's for the uh, the fixed rate cost recovery, the the combined uh, transmission uh, revenue possibility and market participation is very complicated and difficult and is still under review and consideration. So the, the next thing I just want to do very briefly is kind of outline for you the flexibility challenge that we face now in California. Uh, we've done considerable work and analysis on our system about how operational needs are changing, um, especially with the increased levels of uh, wind and solar resources um, now coming online. As we look forward to 2020 uh, and California's 33% uh, renewable standard, which we fully support and are doing everything possible to enable, the net load that must be served with dispatchable resources begins to look very, very different. So what, what we see then uh, as a result, think about it this way. Um, it, it's easier to think about in terms of solar because it's a predictable pattern. So as the sun comes up, the net load we're serving comes down. We're now, in, and you start to see then, I'll go this way, <laughs> the net load comes down with sunrise, so the dispatchable resources are not operating now midday, and net load comes up as uh, solar uh, drops off the system with sunset, and those dispatchable resources then must be available to meet that new peak. We see the challenge most dramatically in the spring um, for a variety of reasons, but we literally see the uh, ramping requirements on our system to meet that evening peak in more than doubling from about 6,000 megawatts uh, in a few hours to 14,000 megawatts in a few hours. So the, what this drives home to us is the, the uh, essential need for flexible resources on the system and the need to design a mechanism to procure resources for, for providing that flexibility and for being available, being remaining available during those hours they might not otherwise generate. So it, it, you know, it really kind of turns things on its head when you think about it. So I spent years and been in this industry for a long time. We all thought that we'd want to be charging our cars, our electric cars at night. We may now want people to plug their cars in during the day. It's a little mind-bending. So we may be asking battery storage to charge during the day when that solar is available and discharge to meet that ramp. So it's, it really does start to change how we think about it, and it's a very fundamental change that is challenging us and I think challenging everyone in the industry to try to think through what these business models need to become in order to be successful. We are uh, fully committed to um, uh, making this work and we're working across the organization. We'll talk a little more about that later, I think. Um, but it's, it is a serious challenge and we need your help to find the ways to create the appropriate revenue streams for you and make sure we have the services available to meet these very uh, uh, significantly changing system needs. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Peterman, uh, what is the role of the CPUC in energy storage and what is happening over there today? Thanks, Brian, and thanks for the invitation to be here with you today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, everyone should be smiling. We made it here, you know, in the traffic, which I, uh, having been previously lead on transportation uh, at the Energy Commission, uh, driving here made me really think we got to get better about public transportation here in uh, the Valley. Um, so as Brian noted, I've been at the Public Utilities Commission for a few months now, and prior to that, I was at the Energy Commission where I was lead commissioner for renewables, transportation, and natural gas. And in that role, um, I increasingly saw the need to think about system balance and the opportunities, especially as we're trying to reach our climate change goals, to find low carbon alternatives uh, to manage some of our renewables integration and also the possibility and potential for electric vehicles uh, to help serve that need. I also serve as the uh, chair of the Plug-in Electric Vehicle Collaborative for the state and through that work uh, have had more exposure in thinking about opportunities uh, for vehicle to grid and battery operations. So at the Public Utilities Commission, uh, I was excited to be assigned the storage proceeding. And as the newly assigned commissioner to that proceeding, I'm working on implementing AB 2514, which uh, thanks to Assembly uh, Member Nancy Skinner, who will be speaking later, uh, was passed in 2009. And AB 2514 requires the Public Utilities Commission 
to determine appropriate targets, if any, for each load-serving entity to procure viable and cost-effective energy storage systems to be achieved by December 2015 and December 2020. Many of you are active in that proceeding, so if I get something wrong, I'm sure you will correct me. Um, the proceeding also allows us to consider a variety of uh, possible policies to encourage the cost-effective deployment of energy storage. To think about how, or to understand how the Public Utilities Commission is implementing 2514, it is important to uh, understand the overall political context in which we're doing this work. And Karen touched on it a bit, but we have a couple of key policies here in the state. Uh, one is the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which uh, was implemented initially in 2002, and uh, it's been upped twice. We now have a target of 33% renewables by 2020. And as Karen noted, as we're, we've been successful, very successful uh, with go, reaching that goal, and now we're starting to see uh, some potential challenges for the system. And then the other policy to be aware of and uh, mindful of is AB 32, which is our uh, greenhouse gas reduction policy. AB 32 requires the state to reduce its greenhouse gases um, um, uh, to 1990 levels by 2020 and then by 80% in 2050. Both of these mandates have created new realities within our electric system that storage may be able to respond to. Acknowledging this, AB 2514 specifically calls for energy storage systems that have attributes to help with greenhouse gas reduction as well as renewables integration. And I'm currently working uh, on a plan to propose to my colleagues um, for storage uh, that would focus on these two benefits. And that's actually a very nice transition into my next question. So I'm glad that uh, the order that, that we took this worked out. Uh, because I wanted to speak a little bit more about those benefits and uh, as the agency that is uh, looking at, at these questions, uh, Commissioner Peterman, I wondered um, if you would be able to give us an update um, the vision with energy storage was at this kind of conceptual level that it, it can be a number of different system needs uh, that are increasingly important today in light of the policies that you just outlined. Uh, but I'm wondering if you can give us an, an update about, you know, more specifically, uh, what have we learned as the proceeding has kind of unfolded and, um, and, and is, that, is that knowledge really kind of evolving? And, and, and if so, how? Sure, I think the knowledge is evolving. I think what we've grown to appreciate is that there are a variety of storage options out there and the California Energy Commission through its research program has done a tremendous amount of work already in this area to look at uh, different uses and applications for storage. But as a part of our proceeding at the PUC, we've developed a set of seven use cases falling into broad categories of transmission connected storage, uh, which my colleagues here have talked about, distribution level storage, and demand side or customer side applications. And these use cases are linked again to the CPUC policy priorities and specifically what I see as some of the benefits of storage, specifically renewables energy integration, load service reliability, global service reliability, peak reduction, and demand side management. Our understanding of the cost effectiveness of storage is evolving and we've done, uh, we've had some recent results in this area, so I want to share those with you. We've applied two cost effectiveness models to our use cases, and the initial results were presented at a workshop on March 25th, 2013, um, and this work is done by consultants EPRI and E3 and Kima. And these results uh, are encouraging. One model um, examined basic feasibility of three use cases, transmission, bulk storage, storage providing frequency regulation services, and distribution storage sited at a utility substation. Modeling results showed that subject to the baked-in assumptions, in most of the cases considered, like all these caveats, a storage system of one of the above types installed in 2020 is likely to have revenue in excess of earnings over 20 years of the project life. And so, looking at a couple cases, I think the key takeaway is that there is some cost-effective storage out there, even under some circumstances where you may not have uh, the full ancillary services markets. 
um, that some have envisioned. The challenge though, so I'll tell you the next step on our cost effectiveness first is that we're gonna solicit comments by parties on the cost effectiveness results. But there's a challenge with looking at cost and benefits still now in that we really don't have much on the ground operational and cost data available. Uh, the Energy Commission, uh, through its research program, has and with work with utilities, have funded a number of storage projects, but many of these won't be online until uh, 2014, 2015. And so these models, these cost effectiveness <coughs> models, do require a number of assumptions. Um, but still, I believe we need to move forward, and we'll continue to incorporate the data uh, that we're getting to help us refine um, our analysis, and as well as refine where we want to go in terms of, if at all, procurement targets. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up on that. Um, what were the three use cases that were analyzed for cost effectiveness again? So, let's see. Well, we had a couple models, and I'm going to look at my staff here to say, but the one model that I was referring to was a use case for... Give me a second. Sure. Many a paper, just not the one I need. Yeah. <coughs> it's page number four, which seems to be the only one not showing up. Okay, here we go. Uh, so it was transmission bulk storage system, storage providing frequency regulation services and distribution storage cited at a utility substation. But these are three use cases and we had seven and um, you can find there's a document our staff put out interim report in January which details all the cases. But it gets the transmission side to deal with some grid reliability, distribution storage, which has the opportunity to actually really help at a distribution substation and providing uh, support there. And then customer side, in thinking about that, perhaps coupled with some of the uh, distributed renewable generation that we've been encouraging. And, and the initial results were that those do provide cost-effective uh, solutions over a 20-year kind of time horizon, is that the gist? In some cases, yes. I say that's the gist. I mean, with some of these, it's what you're comparing it to as well. So for example, um, if you're looking, um, in some cases you're comparing it to what a new peaker will be. And some of the challenges are that we don't know really what a new peaker will cost. We know what they're being bid in for, but we don't know actually what they're going to cost in the end. But, you know, I was talking with staff yesterday about some of these results. And what I appreciate about the analysis that's being conducted is that there are some fairly, I would say fairly conservative assumptions in here. Um, conservative assumptions about uh, declines in technology learning within storage, for example, about the availability of ancillary markets. And so in a number of cases, there are some opportunities for cost-effective storage. Um, and so I think we need to look for those opportunities and continue to identify other market barriers, however. But this is looking at, from a developer's perspective, from storage, if you're building storage, starting in 2020, 20 years forward, starting in 2020, for 20 years, the revenue will exceed the cost. Hope that just did not confuse anyone anymore, but. <laughs> no, that's, that sounds yeah. very it was encouraging. A, I, was, I was encouraged to hear these results. You know, you do this analysis and you hire consultants and you think, come back with something that tells me we're, we've got a chance. And I'm here to tell you, I think we have a chance. <laughs> I'm sure that's very welcome news to, to the audience. And, and uh, given that there is so much work to be done still to create you know, align the, the incentives with the, uh, with the service, I think it's very encouraging to hear that the early results are, are positive. Um, so, and uh, Commissioner Peterman, you mentioned grid reliability. <coughs> uh, one of the uh, benefits that storage can help to provide, which is an increasingly important issue in light of the policy changes that you've outlined, in particular, integration of large-scale variable energy resources. Um, and uh, as, as, as I hope this discussion is sort of demonstrates, uh, getting that done, uh, creating the incentives to enable grid reliability in this more challenging environment really requires the coordinated activity of all the agencies that have a, a, a role to play. And we have two here in California that have a particularly important role, and that is the CPUC and the California ISO. So um, 
Turning to that question of coordination, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Edson and Commissioner Peterman uh, whether you could address the ways in which your agencies are working together to coordinate your agendas in order to bring this uh, resource uh, into fruition and what, if anything, could we do better if, uh, if there is any? Um, thank you, Brian, and, and of course we can always do things better. Uh, let me, though, say that uh, the, the good news is that I think the ISO, the CPUC, and the other state agencies are all committed to the same outcome, and that is reliable operations and effective and um, a large deployment of non-generation alternatives to conventional generation technologies. We know that's really an essential part of our goals for meeting California greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets and has to be an essential part of how we think about these matters going forward. Um, there are a number of things underway that we are doing jointly uh, to that end. Um, one is uh, the ISO is working to um, do a better job of defining the operational needs we have on the system and uh, provide that to the California Public Utilities Commission to inform their thinking and um, regulatory approach to procurement um, because at, uh, at this point in time um, capacity is procured by the public through the by the public utilities commission through the investor and utilities largely uh, meeting most of the needs of California now we do have a number of non-jurisdictional entities also um, in our market uh, that the PUC doesn't touch but um, in some ways they have a free ride on some of that procurement uh, that happens today uh, but that is work that we are doing to give bit better definition. That's also something that will importantly inform work on the demand response side. Um, Commissioner Peterman talked about demand storage as a demand side management. Demand report, uh, response is also a demand side uh, management. Um, the California ISO is working to develop a, a roadmap for demand response that will address a number of issues that are relevant to the storage community as well. Um, and we are uh, hosting a forum in May in cooperation with the PUC and the CEC uh, and demand response providers that may be of interest to you where we really want to hear from parties about what's necessary uh, to make this work. We also um, are involved in a number of uh, pilot projects in California. Um, the PG&E back, back at Dixon project, for example, is one we're working on where uh, there will be data coming in, and of course that will all be shared um, uh, under NDAs as necessary uh, with the Public Utilities Commission uh, and others. So that work is also underway. We also have a, a vehicle-to-grid pilot uh, with the Air Force in the Los Angeles area where there will be, they want to engage directly in the wholesale markets from behind the meter with the battery capability they have on the electric vehicle side. So that will also be a way that we'll start to be able to test some of these mechanisms and the revenue streams that they can create. Um, more generally, we are also exploring um, how direct uh, participation, the tariffs, interconnection rules uh, need to be changed to accommodate uh, the greater deployment of energy storage technology. Um, one area where we continue to have a, a bit of a challenge in coming together in alignment, I think, is with regard to capacity market. One thing that I know uh, Chairman Wellinghoff is well aware of is are we, having just left a, a meeting in Boise, Idaho about an energy imbalance market, uh, for those of you that, that don't know, uh, the, the five-minute uh, redispatch system is really an imbalance market, and we have made an offer to provide that market elsewhere in the West under a very competitive proposal, low-cost entry, low-cost ongoing operations, free exit. But we still find that FERC jurisdiction over that market is an impediment. And we're facing the need to really address in, in tangible, meaningful ways um, uh, that issue in order to attract non-jurisdictional entities into this mechanism. One that provides tremendous economic benefit to them and to California, and provides a tremendous benefit in the form of a better efficient use of the transmission system and better renewable integration. Um, with regard to the, the issues here, the California ISO has been working with the utilities and others to design a three to five year forward capacity market that will procure flexibility. Now this goes to the issue that Chairman Wellinghoff has indicated 
uh, is a challenge. It really, this flexible procurement really hasn't happened before. It's a new way of thinking about what we're procuring and how we get it and how, how much we need. Um, we think that's an important mechanism to have in place so those resources like storage, like conventional generators, like demand response that aren't needed in the middle of the day can be available to meet those needs at other times on the system. So we want, we're advocates of a capacity payment mechanism that would provide that kind of payment stream to storage and demand response and uh, the conventional generators that are also necessary, peaking generators for meeting these system needs. Um, we're told though that the, the Public Utilities Commission is very concerned about the jurisdictional issues here. We're hoping that we can work through those with them, provide mechanisms to give them confidence that that's not what this is about. <laughs> it's not about jurisdiction, it's about making sure we meet the needs. It's also um, though going to be an important mechanism in our mind to deal with the proper cost allocation to entities that aren't part, uh, aren't jurisdictional in the PUC, so if there is appropriate cost allocation. It also is a way to do a mechanism, it optimizes across the entire footprint as well. And it also will allow annual true-ups um, in, a, in a way that further optimizes and allows for adjustments as demands change on the system. So that's a very important initiative and requires considerable more work to overcome, I think, the, the issues that I identified. The last thing I want to note, which I think is a very important initiative as well, uh, that demonstrates the kind of collaboration that's underway, has to do with all of those assumptions that go into our transmission planning, our modeling of the system, the Public Utilities Commission procurement decisions. Um, uh, the extent, it goes to really the extent to which um, available demand response, energy efficiency, and other things are taken into account in establishing the targets that we're going after. So the three entities, the Public Utilities Commission, the California Energy Commission, and the California ISO have come, are working now through the details of a, a high level agreement we've reached to make sure that we have a mechanism for aligning those planning assumptions and that we do that in the context of the Energy Commission's integrated energy um, planning policy report. Thank you. It's the, the, the report that produces their uh, demand forecast. So we are um, having conversations now at the staff level across our organizations to make sure that we have a, a solid process for getting those assumptions aligned to the extent that we have disagreements in that process, a mechanism to escalate those disagreements to senior management and to the, and to the senior executive level, the president of the commission, the chair of the energy commission, and the CEO of the California ISO, so that we can make sure that we have that kind of alignment. I think that as well will, I hope, contribute to overcoming some of the difficulties and the jurisdictional concerns that we hear about. But we are definitely working together. We have a, we can do a lot better, and I'm optimistic that we'll find our path forward. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, I'll note that AB 2514 specifically requires the CPUC to work with the ISO and to incorporate uh, any ISO analysis on storage in our proceeding and in our decision making. And so it really identified up front the need for uh, our agencies to coordinate. And as Karen noted, um, the Public Utilities Commission and the ISO and the Energy Commission have been coordinating to look at this question of uh, how do we have the flexible resources that we'll need, particularly to integrate renewables. And we had a very productive meeting with about 450 people were there it's about a couple months ago. It was an en banc looking at the, some of the various options. And when it comes to, I think one of the challenges facing us all is really identifying what is the need. Um, and that need can vary, and we have various options for reducing the need for flexible resources. Everything from encouraging a diversified uh, renewable portfolio. One of our challenges is that our portfolio is dominated, increasingly dominated with solar. Uh, currently, uh, wind has a larger share, but by 2020, you can expect solar PV to be about 33%. And when you have such a variable resource, it does create some challenges. We do have other renewables that we're pursuing, uh, such as bioenergy, for example, and geothermal, and those are less intermittent and can help reduce some of that need. You can also reduce some of that need for flexibility, as Karen noted, with an energy imbalance market, uh, with improved forecasting, um, with demand response, and so we're interested uh, in all those options. Uh, going forward, I think it's important, as we're trying to figure out whatever the right mechanism 
uh, we need to procure that capacity for the future, whether that be a capacity market or some other mechanism, it's important that California maintains its authority to uh, implement programs that are in support of our sustainable energy goals. Um, we want to make sure that we have the opportunity uh, to continue to pr uh, promote the preferred resources um, that we have found so important for our state. Uh, I think what's exciting for the first time for California is that we're not the first ones out on some, a topic. So we're not the first ones to consider a capacity market. And so we can look to the experience from the East, some of the lessons learned, and think about really what is the right approach for California. Uh, so again, we're continuing to coordinate, and as Karen noted, it's a tremendous step, this coordination we're going to have around some of the assumptions in modeling our need, assumptions around energy efficiency, assumptions about, around the availability of demand response. Uh, the more we can come and uh, have some consensus around those issues, uh, we'll be able to figure out what mechanisms, storage or natural gas facilities will be best to meet that need. Thank you. Uh, that, again, was such a great transition. I just, we're on the same page here. I really appreciate Mind that. Mind out here, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I wanted to actually ask that, uh, the question. You mentioned that, for once, we're not the first ones out of the gate. And uh, um, so I was going to turn back to Chairman Willinghoff, uh, who brings a national perspective, obviously, uh, as Chairman of FERC, and ask you a little bit about your perspective on what um, uh, what you're seeing uh, nationwide in the different regions and um, what they're doing to bring storage onto the grid, uh, which ones are furthest along, and uh, what can we in California learn from their experience? Well, as, as Carla mentioned, there are a number of other um, ISOs out there, RTOs, that do have capacity markets, and uh, because of those capacity markets, they in essence have another product that's available to a uh, provider of service. Um, usually those capacity markets, those I mentioned in my opening, are not something that are uh, necessarily attractive to storage. Uh, but the markets that have been attracted to the storage uh, resources in other uh, regions have been the ancillary services market. And under the 755 order that I mentioned, that fast response um, service that can be provided has attracted a, a number of uh, battery and flywheel manufacturers in areas of New York and New England that ha have uh, put in uh, substantial resources to take advantage of those uh, higher prices that can be received through the, the Order 755 uh, uh, service market. In addition, uh, there's areas that are looking at uh, Karen mentioned uh, that uh, the DOD is going to do here in California uh, have actually demonstrated in other markets the ability to do vehicle to grid and I think this is one of the real emerging areas of the utilization of batteries of using batteries for dual or multiple purposes uh, on the grid and off the grid and referring specifically to batteries in vehicles where they are used for their primary, for the primary purpose of providing transportation services, but can be used at the same time that they're charging for the provision of ancillary services. And this was demonstrated first in PGM, the uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, ISO. And in PGM, they uh, had a demonstration at the University of Delaware where there were seven uh, electric vehicles that were connected to the grid, and that at night to charge and, and during the charging period they were receiving a regulation signal from PGM and as they received that regulation signal those batteries would respond to it and provide a regulation service rig up or rig down depending upon the, upon the signal and do that at the same time they're actually charging the battery so there was no diminution of the ability for the battery to be charged but there was an ability to provide a regulation service to the grid simultaneously to that charging function. So the ultimate result was the car was getting charged, but it also was getting paid for providing regulation services. So those cars got paid some, somewhere between 7 and $10 per day per car to provide that regulation service uh, to PGM Grid, which in essence was more than the cost of them charging the car. They were in essence charging the car for, 
for free. So these kinds of dual services are things that we need to explore more. Again, that was on a demonstration basis, but now PGM has lowered their uh, regulation service uh, uh, minimum amount to 100 kilowatts, so you can aggregate 100 kilowatts worth of uh, electric vehicles, in essence, and provide that in to PGM as a regulation service and provide a revenue stream that, in essence, can pay for those batteries in that car that oftentimes are more expensive than the internal combustion engine alternative. So I, I think there's some very interesting things going on because we've been able to put in place some of these market rules that allow for the recognition of the unique, unique characteristics of these kinds of assets. And just to follow up, the threshold for participation was 100 kilowatts? That's correct, 100 kilowatts. What type of entity would be able to, to aggregate electric vehicles at that scale? What are we talking about? Well, 100 kilowatts, uh, let's see, I, I think a Tesla's got about 56 kilowatts in it, so you, you only need a couple of Teslas to ag aggregate together. I think a Leaf, I think, I think, I think a Leaf, Leaf is like 18 uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, so uh, ultimately, you know, you don't need many vehicles, but certainly any fleet entities, anybody who had uh, uh, a fleet of, uh, of vehicles could do it. Uh, and it wouldn't be restricted to uh, to uh, automobiles either. It could be uh, forklifts in a warehousing facility. It could be golf carts at a you know a, a golfing facility. I mean anything that has batteries in it that charges overnight. Ultimately, uh, if it has the proper communications uh, devices in them that again were developed at the University of Delaware uh, that I, I know that are now licensing to private company. Uh, it ultimately could be uh, aggregated and provided to PGM. I'm sorry, I'm also comment on the electrical vehicle front. In addition to doing uh, vehicle to grid while you're owning the car, we've approved uh, for a couple of our utilities to do demonstration projects with batteries as a second life application. And so your battery and your electric vehicle degrades over time uh, and it can degrade to a point where it's not successful for EV, but it could very well, uh, you could aggregate a number of batteries and use them for something like distribution level storage. And so the utilities will be looking at various ways to do this, including how to outreach to customers to get their interest. But the challenge we're facing on the electric vehicle side is that even though costs have come down tremendously for the cars, uh, they're still more expensive than traditional vehicles. So this can be a win-win because they can provide a different um, monetary stream for electric vehicle producers as well as provide grid reliability for the utilities. Uh, so it's an area that I'm excited about because I also have electric vehicle proceeding and so I'm looking at the connections between both of these. Is anyone from Tesla here? Because I know that Tesla actually has a business model for taking the batteries from their cars and doing exactly that. They didn't want to tell the ISO about that. It had to do with going off the grid, but they did confess to us when they <laughs> You're doing it sometimes combined with solar. Is that the double whammy from the ISO exactly. perspective? That's exactly right. But I, let me just mention one other thing, and it goes to this flexibility issue and flexibility reserves. Because we now are thinking about our reserve requirements, not just in terms of a capacity reserve, but in terms of a flexibility reserve. And it's not a formal requirement now, but we, we have it, and we look at it, and we enforce it. It's where we uh, identify a number of the benefits, for example, in an energy imbalance market. It's having that flexibility capability expanded across a bigger footprint and across uh, where you get the time differentiated benefits as well. So um, uh, the system is changing again. Well, we are winding down and uh, we'll open it up to questions in just a moment. Uh, so if you've got those, uh, uh, we'll turn to you in a moment. Uh, the last question I'll just ask is a toss-up question that I'll throw out. Um, this is a, uh, which is going to achieve scale quicker? Uh, behind the meter energy storage, utility side energy storage, or something different? Well, I'll take this one and say I, I hope whatever we need most. Um, and you know, be, because of that, there are all these different applications for storage. And uh, as I've been thinking through the proposal uh, that I want to put forward to the other commissioners on storage, um, I envision doing a proposal where we have procurement megawatt targets for different use cases and some type of regular uh, procurement. 
and having flexible procurement so that there are some uh, off ramps for cost and reasonableness. But as I noted earlier, there are a number of different applications. And so we still are getting on the ground experience with these projects. And so I think it's unlikely, for example, that storage will reach its full potential without some type of procurement encouragement. Um, and it's a little early, I think, to pick winners, if you will. Again, there are a tremendous number of applications, and we're going to need to establish a real base in all of them uh, as we move forward. Um, so I'll say stay tuned uh, for something to come out of my office. Uh, please don't pester my staff or the PUC staff for any more details on this proposal. Um, when it comes out, there will be significant and ample time uh, for your input. I'm planning to have an all-party meeting with everyone in the storage proceeding because I haven't had a chance uh, to meet with you individually yet, um, but that's the direction I'd like to go. And I'll say from first perspective, we want the market to pick the winners. And so, you know, I, I can't tell you between the two, although what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a, a huge ramp up of distributed generation, especially distributed solar. So you would think that logically uh, distributed storage would fall. But again, I think it's going to be a, a market decision. Look to follow the needs of the system, as you all have spoken to. Uh, well, with that, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, please help me, uh, join me in thanking all of our panelists. And we have about 10 minutes for audience questions. Do we have uh, microphones or? Yes, we do. OK, so uh, yes. Sir, go ahead. Hello, thank you for this. My name is William Todorov. We're a startup manufacturer of non-toxic, non-thermal thermal runaway saline batteries. And I have a question about recycling the batteries. Uh, for use charging the utility. If it's no longer valuable in the car because you put 100 watts in, you only get 40 out. What's the value of that in terms of the chemical loss in using it for recycling? If you're putting 100 watts in and only getting 40 out, it seems like you'd be better off recycling the battery. Oh, I'm not a scientist, sir. Maybe you can help me answer that question. You know, it's a, it's a good point to raise, and that's what we want to consider. What, what are the alternatives? What's the counterfactual if we weren't going to be using it, for example, for grid reliability? But your point's well taken. Hi, uh, Judith Schwartz from To The Point. One of the challenges that technology companies have in this space is that because all 50 states have different rules, it becomes very challenging to design products that can be used nationally. Does storage present an unusual opportunity to have the state commissions work with FERC to be able to come up with something, at, whether it's standards or sharing information in some way or doing common rules, so that there actually is an economic viability for somebody to come up with good solutions because they won't need 50 different ones? Well, we certainly attempt to work with state commissions as much as possible, um, certainly when they're working with their stakeholders within a RTO to formulate different concepts and different market rules and try to work with them as much as possible in that regard. Now, I don't know about standards. I think that's probably probably in, in Pat Hoffman's purview over DOE, so I'll stay out of the standards area. Um. It's always helpful to have some common understanding of attributes, um, but I'll say I don't think the challenge from a technology perspective nationwide is the lack of standards. I think it's a range and need for storage at this point in time. I was on a panel with some commissioners from other states uh, about a year and a half ago, and California at the time uh, was the only one that had a law to look at storage, and even our law is looking at cost-effective storage. and so. And other states weren't even thinking about that. So partly this is um, encouraged by our renewables development. And so I think you can look to other states that have renewables. They'll be facing some of these challenges down the line. But for states that don't, I still think storage is probably too expensive for them to be thinking about seriously. Arthur Havenstock, Perkins Coie. There seems to me to be a race between market needs and market rules. We've got the advent of what I think of as the ducks of spring. The ISO refers to 
the duck curve, it's the curve that Karen Edson talked about where you've got these tremendous ramps down and tremendous ramps up that mostly occur in the spring. We have tremendous need for flexible capacity on the system. And the question is whether we're going to be able to have the market rules that are being developed at FERC and at the PUC and to some degree through the ISO's proceedings that will support storage being a solution to the ducks or are we going to end up needing that flexibility so quickly that we're going to only see conventional resources as the primary answer to that? Well, I, let me just offer a few comments. Um, the, the flexibility requirements, so in terms of the needs on the system, a significant contributor to those needs is, the, uh, is compliance with California's once through cooling policy. Uh, that's a policy that applies to about 12,000 megawatts of generation located along the California coast, including the state's two nuclear plants. Um, it's, uh, in the north, most of the compliance is solved, but in the south, very little of it is solved. And so if those compliance deadlines uh, remain in effect, they hit in 2018 and 2020, we will lose in the LA basin about 6,700 megawatts of installed capacity. CLA Basin alone doesn't count uh, Big Creek, Ventura, or San Diego. So with that loss of capacity, it, it, it's kind of a twofer, really. You have to run the existing generation that's flexible harder to meet overall demand, and guess what? It's not available for flexibility. So um, there is, I think, a need to um, think through the timing of these things so that um, we can have the tools in place and not become a victim of um, uh, just a, a victim of the timing of the of the needs. Um, having said that, the the challenge we face, fr I mean, frankly, there's an easy solution to these flexibility needs, right? I mean, I don't want to say it, but I will. It's curtailing the renewables. Now, that's the last thing we want to do. That the ISO we're absolutely committed to making sure that we're doing everything possible to allow compliance with adopted state policies, including the ones to cooling policy, including the RPS policy. So the recommendations that we put forward are ones that are carefully designed to accomplish all of those policies at the same time. But if we don't get, if we don't have the resources on the system, that that alternative is there. I mean, we will maintain reliability. I guess that's the bottom line, and it's something I think is important to convey. The lights aren't going to go out, but we may have some very unhappy consequences if we don't go about this in a, an an orderly way. And just uh, to add, add to that, what. Uh, Karen said, um, I, I think we are somewhat ahead of the curve on the rules out there with respect to storage with 755. I think that was a very forward looking and innovative rule. And in addition, you have to remember that we don't have to do everything through rules, just like we did Western Grid. We can do them on a case by case basis if necessary. So if California has a specific case, a specific issue, or the Cal ISO needs to do something, they can bring that case to us, make the case present the evidence and we can do it on an individual case basis. It doesn't have to be a necessarily generic rule. So there's multiple ways to approach it. And if there's you know, region-specific problems, we're very sensitive to those region-specific problems. And we're very willing to try to work with the region, both the ISO and the state commissions, and try to do what we can to put in place as quickly as we can what needs to be done to meet the reliability needs. I'll also just add, the challenges we're facing will likely be more of a cost issue first before a reliability issue. And so when I talked about distribution level storage, the opportunity for that just provides an opportunity to def um, uh, delay some of the uh, substation upgrade costs, for example. So uh, to your point, Arthur, I think that there are, for some types of storage uh, or some types of flexibility issues, we may have an immediate need to deal with them with a natural gas plant, but there are other applications where uh, there could be some benefit now. We're talking about smaller scale systems, a couple of megawatts versus the larger ones. Um, hi. hi. Okay, go ahead. We have time for just one quick one. Uh, I, those of you that I know. Um, I want to understand a little bit more about the imbalance market that you were talking about, Karen. And <clears throat> because it seems like that would have a huge potential. Um, but we've got, what is it, 35 or 36? balancing authorities just in the West? Um, and are they really effectively gatekeepers on the offering of imbalanced services between them? And why wouldn't uh, FERC have jurisdiction to remove those discriminatory 
seemingly discriminatory barriers if the potential is that large, including storage. Well, I'll, I'll talk about part of this. <laughs> we, we do have 37 balancing authorities in the West. Um, California serves about 30% of the load. BPA serves another huge chunk. Um, Pacific Corp is the company that's uh, agreed to participate in the California ISO's energy and balance market. You take those three off the top, you're left with 34 balancing authorities dividing a very small amount of uh, load. You take LA and SMUD out and you're even down to itsy bitsy pieces. And it, it is a challenge. It's a challenge in terms of um, uh, their willingness to the jurisdictional issue that I mentioned. I think there's a, a certain reluctance, a sense of giving up control. The, the energy imbalance market we're offering is our current five minute redispatch market. Um, so it's, if those of you that know our markets, you know how it works. We're starting a stakeholder process. In fact, the first meeting in that process is today, in Folsom. Um, and we've laid out the straw proposal for market design, and we've identified a number of other policy issues. Um, as for the you know, FERC's authority in this regard, in terms of the number of balancing authorities, I, I defer that to the chairman. It's a, it's a tough, di tough, difficult issue. Contributes, I think, to certain reliability issues. Um, it, uh, the compliance now with reliability uh, standards, I think, will, is starting to drive a certain consolidation, but it's slow moving. And Joshua, Joshua, as you know, the FERC's policy has been in the past with respect to individual balancing authorities and the transmission owners in those balancing authorities to allow them to voluntarily decide whether or not they want to join a larger organization, whether or not they want to give over some level of authority of their transmission, although with this EIM uh, process, it's not necessary to do that, but, but at least to, in essence, collaborate with the ISO in this way to, to set up this market. Um, FERC policy historically has been to allow them to decide that on their own voluntarily. doesn't mean that we may not have the authority to force them to do that, although one of my predecessors, two chairmen back, did something called SMD, and he wasn't there very long, so standard market design. So um, again, I think, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the, the best, uh, approach is the carrot and not the stick. We're, we're trying to show the balancing authorities in the West what are the uh, costs and benefits, and there's a lot of discussion and a lot of analysis going on on determining these costs and benefits for them. And you know, to Pacific Corp's credit and to Mid-America's credit who owns Pacific Corp, they understand it's a business proposition. It makes sense to them. They're going to save anywhere from 30 to 100 some odd million dollars a year by uh, have, allowing the ISO to, to operate this energy imbalance market for them. And it's, it's a good deal. Um, but hopefully the rest of the balance authorities in the West will see it similarly that it will be a good deal for them. And with that, we're going to have to wrap up here. Uh, please join me again in thanking our panel. Ryan O'Ryan and to our panelists for being with us here today. To introduce our next speaker, I'd like to invite up Dan Rassler, the Senior Manager of Strategic Initiatives and Demonstrations at EPRI and a member of Joint Ventures Energy Storage Advisory Committee. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, good morning. It's uh, really a, a pleasure for me to introduce Patricia Hoffman, the Assistant Secretary in the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. I've actually known Patricia for, for quite some time, and I'm really delighted that uh, she could make it out here, uh, given her busy schedule, and provide uh, her perspectives and insights on the role of, that storage is going to play in, in the evolving and modern grid. Her office leads the Department of Energy's efforts to modernize the electric grid through the development and implementation of national policy pertaining to electric grid reliability and the management of research and development and demonstration activities 
for the next generation of electric grid infrastructure technologies. She's responsible for developing and implement, implementing a long-term research strategy for modernizing and improving the resiliency of the electric grid. And she directs research on visualization and controls, energy storage and power electronics, high temperature superconductivity, renewables and distributed energy systems integration. Before joining the Office of Electricity Delivery, she was program director for the Federal Energy Management Program, which implemented energy, effic energy efficiency measures throughout the federal sector. And she was also program manager of the Distributed Energy Program that developed such things as advanced natural gas power generation and combined heat power systems. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree and a Master of Science degree in Ceramic and Engineering from Penn State University. Please join me in welcoming Pat Hoffman. Tell you, people don't know how to listen. I told them to keep it short. <laughs> First of all, thank you all for uh, coming today and thank you all for having me here today. I, I'm, I'm excited actually. I was doing budget rollout yesterday at the Department of Energy I wasn't sure whether I was actually going to make it or not, <laughs> but managed to successfully get through uh, uh, the president's and the department's rollout of the budget. And we also had uh, earlier this week uh, the nomination hearing of Dr. Moniz, um, who was nominated for the secretary of the Department of Energy. And so spent some activities and some time kind of just doing some generic introductions to the program of what's going on. And we'll talk about that a little bit because there was one thing that was brought up in his nomination hearing that I think you all should be uh, very tuned into for some that don't know uh, the mention of energy storage at his nomination hearing. First of all, I'd like to thank Microsoft and Joint Venture for having this meeting. I hope that I can tie together some of the system aspects and what we're doing on the system. I'll probably start out by broadening my discussion a little bit, talking about what our goals and objectives are and then fine-tune it down to energy storage and how we should look at the strategy for energy storage, continuing to try and pull this complex, dynamic conversation together in pieces and see what we can focus on and move forward with. So first of all, uh, the Department of Energy and my organization is looking at grid modernization. And when I, I look at that, I'm really looking at the flexibility of the grid to adapt to clean energy, resiliency, in the electric grid and the reliability of the electric grid. Uh, through the Recovery Act, we have had $4.5 billion to invest in the electric infrastructure. We did numerous pilot projects, uh, you know, demonstration projects in the area of energy storage. We looked at uh, demonstrating synchrophasers on the transmission system, smart meters, advanced distribution technologies. What we were really going after, which ties to some of the information, but creating an information revolution in the electric sector. As we continue in the prior panel, talked about the analysis that needs to be done. It was really trying to unlock that data to get greater clarity on the data of what's happening on the system so that we could further develop the analysis and actually get to some of those decisions that need to be made from a regulatory point of view. I mean, the one thing that I'm appreciative of is the partnership with the states in doing pilot projects. And we need to continue to do some of those pilot projects to continue to get the data that we require and the information to move forward. The other part of our organization looks at R&D activities. And why is that important? Because cost was brought up, and we'll talk about this in a little bit in the future. But one of the roles of the Department of Energy is to help reduce the cost of some of these systems, whether you're talking solar, wind, storage, what we want to do is help get these technologies to be cost competitive, and so we want to drive some of that. So in getting started, where are we heading? As we look at the future of the electric in infrastructure, you know, right now we have one-way flow. We want to really make the system more flexible on how it manages flow across the system. And what we want to do is be able to utilize the transmission and distribution system better. Part of that is around controlling power flow. 
energy storage is the other component to that. So those are the two, I would say, options of really creating a revolution in the operation of the, of the transmission and distribution structure as we have it today. The second thing is, is we know we need to have flexibility. It was mentioned this morning, it'll, it'll be mentioned in the future, whether you're talking electric vehicles, solar systems, solar panels, PV systems, wind systems, offshore development. You know, the grid is going to be more dynamic, both on the generation side and on the demand side. So as you look at demand response technologies, we are going to have to be dynamic in how we operate the grid. Well, in order to do so, we need the information systems, we need the capabilities out there to manage a grid like we haven't managed it before. And I think it's really exciting, and I mean, I, I, I compliment Karen for some of her comments. And where I'm going after is from an engineering point of view of the grid. And that is, what is the operational needs? Tell me the system that you have, take a hard look at your system, because you know it's different from in southern and Southern's region in the Southeast United States versus PJM's region versus Cal ISO. There are different system requirements and, and, and different attributes that are evolving on the grid. So we need to be able to do very specific regional analysis and look at where the future policies are heading and figure out how can we build the grid to support that, to drive the flexibility that's required. The other thing is we're in a period of uh, investment. It's coming, you're seeing signs of it. Uh, New Jersey's looking at investment in their distribution system. And I guess I should say a lot of it is the advancement in the distribution system that we need to evolve the distribution system. So there is a great opportunity here and take a hard look at the distribution system and that interface with the transmission system at the substation level and say, how can we incorporate the greatest extent flexibility as possible? And that means energy storage, it means demand response, it means the use of natural gas technologies. But how do we make it synergistic? So when I look at this, I'm, I'm all about how do we optimize the system? And so from an engineering point of view, you can look at the different characteristics of the region and say, how do we optimize it? How do we look at the synergistic balance between natural gas technologies, energy storage, and renewable technologies, and say, and let's look at those capabilities. When Karen talked about, oh, we may need to, you know, charge and use energy storage during the day, you know, that is really where we're trying to look at is what is the future requirements, and how do we really want to optimize to meet those needs. Uh, I guess the other thing that I will push into, into you some of your thoughts and thinking, whether you're talking, and I'll back up from, from uh, the joint venture's point of view, from a state sustainability, is how are we going to build resiliency in the system? Uh, for those of you that aren't from the East Coast and didn't get hit with Irene and Sandy, there is a huge thrust on the East Coast in saying, how do we build resiliency at the distribution level? Resiliency is very hard. Like any, I, you know, I know we're struggling with capturing the value and benefit of energy storage. Trust me, and help, and I got to figure out how to capture the value and the benefit of resiliency as we look at how do we build robustness in the system? How do we build capacity so that we actually have some resiliency in the system? And so that's one of the things that we're doing as we're moving forward. So where I want to go, uh, just briefly, and because there was so, so much discussion this morning on some of the market applications, I'm probably going to flip through some of the regional market slides very quickly, but spend a little bit of time on where we see some of the challenges and opportunities with energy storage, but really go through, uh, maybe it's a roadmap, maybe it's a framework for discussion. Now, what happened at uh, Dr. Moniz's hearing is the, probably a precursor to why I started doing this, was uh, Senator Wyden said to Dr. Moniz, if confirmed, will you please produce an energy storage strategy document? And he said, I've been asking for this for the past three and a half years. Well, we've done a lot of storage documents. 
But what it comes down to it is how do we get storage over that line? I think what we're missing is what does it require? What do we require to get energy storage to that next level? So let me let me put it in, in several kind of points and then I'll go through the points in my presentation. Is so what is the delta from a cost point of view? What do we need to get energy storage down to? What is the price pinch point? What is the gap there? And so what do we need to do and what is some aggressive programs to get us there? Now, does that mean we need an incentive program, you know, et cetera, or, or future more R&D in certain areas for cost reduction, system performance, et cetera, demonstration projects, et cetera? What, what do we need to get that cost down to, to where it's closer? What are some of the, you know, the market gaps and the policy gaps? And I think a lot of that was discussed in the earlier panel, so I'll leave those discussions more to the experts in the earlier panel. I just wanted to tease it as I, as I put the whole uh, perspective together. And then I know that Chairman Wellenhoff brought up standards, but I, I think really it goes back to, are we all looking at the benefits and doing some of those calculations in, in similar manners? and looking at what is the performance of the energy storage systems. And so we can document the value. And so that as people look at including energy storage, how can we make sure that we're on the same page? So once again, when we look at energy storage, and as I started thinking about the, the roadmap and Dr. Moniz's hearing, you know, he said he fundamentally started, well, our research and our program is to develop new innovative kind of storage technologies but also really what it's going after is hitting that cost point. So what can we develop that's innovative? What can we do to help drive the cost down? So how can we get that cost down and then scale it up so that we're doing demonstration projects, we're actually proving the viability, the effectiveness, the benefits for the application that energy storage uh, can be utilized. You know, there was talk, uh, discussion of the pilot projects of the electric vehicles back to the grid and there's a multitude of pilot projects that we are working on to validate and verify the value and the benefits of energy storage and I think we need to keep we need to get that information out we need to make sure that as people are doing these demonstration projects that we can pull and tease the information out for the betterment of the community so as we do that then it really goes into what types of incentives how far are we off in either the cost side of things or, or trying to do market incentives, loan guarantees, other kind of, you know, what I'll say, uh, widespread adoption type uh, incentive type programs to get in storage where it needs to go. So it was talked about earlier, what do we compare storage to, you know, and th these were some of the charts that there's numerous charts out there. But I think we need to continue to look at where is the cost for energy storage uh, technologies. What is it competing against um, from a regulation point of view? You know, you're talking gas turbines, you're talking demand response. So what is it competing against, but where are we and where is the gap that we need to cover? Where is the future cost for energy storage? I know that was uh, mentioned in some of the discussions. Where are we heading? So we've been looking at where are some of the opportunities to get that price down, to get the cost uh, down, and, and where are some of the promising applications as we continue to grow and advance energy storage. So when we do our R&D program across the Department of Energy, we really take, I want to say a system viewpoint, but a holistic viewpoint of the development of the technologies, all the way from some of the component development and bringing in RBE, the office assignments, um, our, our activity under Dr. Druk, which I think most of you know, and really t trying to pull together and bringing the cost down that improve the performance of the technologies. I, I have several of these slides where it goes through some of the technology development. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I, I know that you all will get a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation. So I just ask you to think about that as we continue to look at the roadmap and moving forward. So this one is also on the ultra battery and some of the performance with the um, 
advanced uh, carbon lead battery and, and some of the components that we pulled together and bringing that from conceptual design to actually demonstration and manufacturing. <clears throat> this is course regulation and frequency. Uh, wanted to point out there that it is really an integrated effort within the Department of Energy. You'll see some small business innovation uh, activities, you'll see some RPE activities. We spend a lot of time and care and diligence in saying how can we leverage even the loan guarantee, the different resources that the department has in, in getting the technology through the development phase to the demonstration phase. Uh, I'm not going to go through this one because this one actually just continues to talk about some of the partnerships with the other one and I want to get into some more of the system viewpoints. Uh, I just wanted to do a shout out to the FERC, FERC Commissioner because I think some of the activities in the market side with respect to the regulation and the FERC order is really starting to say how can we push the market attributes or the market opportunities to the next level. So I wanted to recognize that. So now as we get into some of the demonstration projects, what we're starting to do is figure out what are some of the synergistics, uh, synergis, synergistic operations, I should say, at the generation as you talk about renewable technologies. And I think it comes down to the debate that we're having is where is, the, where is energy storage best valued? Is it closer to the wind? generation and paired up with the wind generation or is it better valued as a system asset maybe not necessarily at the plant but somewhere on the system where it can provide multiple services the only way we're really going to do that is really to assign somebody to look at the operational parameters and say what does the system require going back to what Karen said earlier what are the operational requirements and, and it's really very much an analysis that has to occur in each of the regions with each of the technologies to really figure out that optimization as we move forward. Once again, it was mentioned earlier, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it varies by location. So those locational analysis is really critical in moving forward and how we actually can get the value out of energy storage that, that is needed. So one of the things we also, I, I had pushed the question and I said, well, how much energy storage is required? And then, it, then the question came back, well, what do you need it for? And so the system operators, we asked the labs to say, okay, pick an application and let's try to figure out what are the boundary conditions. So for example, how much storage Really, if you really want to optimize performance on the system, you may need so much demand response on your system. You may need so much uh, natural gas fire generation. You may need X amount of energy storage. And so we asked the labs and other entities to start playing with some of those discussions as we talk about an optimization of, of the portfolio and what would be some of those requirements. So this was the study, and I believe the next page actually has the web link to the study looking at some inter-hour balancing requirements and how much energy storage would be useful with a 20% RPS standard in the WEC region. So microgrids. At the, and I noticed uh, Chris Monet is here somewhere, and from LBL. And one of the things that we're doing with microgrids is once again an optimization discussion at the distribution level. But what we want to do is figure out how do we look at the synergistic uh, technologies but really say can we optimize the operations and performance of the electric grid. And that's where we're going to end up going I think at the distribution level. And really saying because you're going to have a lot of customer on site PV systems and we're going to have to figure out how we can optimize. Otherwise, you know, the fear is you could, we could end up, as uh, a couple of the European communities have, with, you know, reserve capacity equal to the amount of renewables that are out there. I think we can do better from an economic and from a performance basis. So we really have to do, continue to do some of these optimizations, but how would you operate from a reliability point of view, from a resiliency point of view, a microgrid? that can provide as much flexibility as possible. 
So we've done several microgrid type projects. Um, I know Hawaii's done a, a big renewable integration project. I know somebody's here uh, from Hawaii. There you are. <laughs> Terry's here. Um, what we're trying to do as we do microgrids, and we're actually doing the projects also with the Department of Defense, is look at, as you have an RPS, how would you size the system to really optimize some performance characteristics, but actually look at different technologies. I think diversity is very important. I was very pleased in some of the conversations to really talk about the diversity, even when you're talking about renewable technologies. We do need an all the above. We need um, some you know, base load type renewable technologies in addition to the wind and the solar. So how do you look at those portfolio balancing? So we have several projects that we're looking at as we funded through the Recovery Act. Definitely driving at how do you optimize and, and design the system, whether you're talking at a distribution. There's a, a couple projects as well that have been outside the Department of Energy that are really taking, even at university campuses, but saying how do we look at critical loads like lab space, making sure that's up, especially when a hurricane or a snowstorm comes through. How do you drive resiliency in comparison as you look at the operation of the electric grid? I think there is some, I'd like to say that there is great evolvement, um, maturation in the industry as itself as solar manufacturers, PV manufacturers are looking at how energy storage plays a, a role. The utilities are getting excited. Uh, I would encourage and I would like to see more demonstration projects at the utility level so that we can continue to look at some of those performance characteristics, long-term durability, thermal management, electrical management. We need to make sure that we can actually do the performance uh, characteristics and get that information out. Uh, I put this up, but I think most people will tell you that the market and the potential is great for energy storage. But it's, it's now, how do we continue to develop that roadmap to get us there? And so that's one of the things that we want to try and do. What we're looking at is probably two things. The development of a quadrennial energy review, which is looking at the different technologies and the energy strategies. Several states have their own energy plans. But how do we pull that together from a stationary point of view? And the department will also look at it from a transportation point of view. Uh, Chairman Wellenhoff brought up electric vehicles, but it's also fixed-use vehicles where there is a great opportunity for those slightly bit larger capacity storage systems for electric vehicles, some of your delivery vehicles, some of your mail, mail uh, trucks, etc., school buses. You know, very much a good opportunity for fixed-use vehicles to also provide support to the electric grid. So there is a huge opportunity out there. Now it's how do we work the markets, how do we actually do continue to do some sound engineering as we look at optimization of the system? What we ultimately want to do is get to sustainability. And I think that was feeding it back to the beginning of the conference of why we're all here. Because there is a huge opportunity right now as we reinvest in our distribution system to take a hard look at what do we want to build and how do we want to build it. And it means we have to ask some tough questions at the PUC level, but also at the policy level of what are the objectives that we want to achieve. And the objectives focus on, once again, clean energy, resiliency, especially since I respond to a lot of hurricanes, you know, and reliability of the system. So as we move forward, the more we define what we want to achieve, then I think we can build the system to help meet the future needs and also to keep the price of electricity down. So thank you. And I left some time for questions. So I hope um, I can help answer some questions. Thank you for the uh, presentation. One thing, uh, you know, I was just talking to another engineer, uh, U.S. educated, uh, uh, major in chem uh, chemistry, and uh, currently working on the battery uh, chemistry. 
type of uh, material science technology. Uh, he indicated to me that uh, the big three in terms of uh, uh, the investment and also the, uh, the uh, uh, industry endorsement for the battery technology at this moment is Japan first, South Korea second, and China the third. So I asked him, uh, you're in U.S. right now, working in U.S. Uh, what do you feel about uh, where we stand in this technology, material science technology for batteries? And he told me that uh, we are probably number eight or nine or ten. So uh, what is our uh, vision uh, as a nation uh, with respect to this uh, critical technology? Because we all know I mean, uh, everybody is working on the smart grid, and everybody wants the smart grid to be very resilient, uh, very uh, uh, ubiquitous, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, from technology point of view, especially a fundamental like uh, material science technology for battery, we're so behind. So we, we, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the materials field, whether you talk about batteries or you talk about composites um, for the T and D system composite conductors. Uh, but let, let me go back. Uh, we're going to have to get enough momentum behind some of the critical things that we need to work on in the United States. And with the Recovery Act, we we're actually able to focus the department's effort and say, one of the greatest opportunity, and I mentioned three areas of opportunities on the electric grid, was information technologies. And in order to get some of the advancements with the market introduction of energy storage, looking at restoration and outage management, we needed to step up the, the availability of information, the analytics on the electric grid for information technology. So that became a very ripe opportunity to say, look, we're going to actually try to move the U.S. ahead of the game with the operations of the electric grid and driving some of the synchrophaser efforts and looking at um, the transmission system not only from a forensics point of view, but to a predictive point of view where we can do better analysis on contingencies. So I spent a whole effort focusing on uh, uh, information technologies. As part of the Recovery Act, at the time, we knew we needed to get some demonstration projects out there on energy storage. We wanted to say, okay, we've got to get energy storage a little bit over the hump with respect to prove the value and help with that benefits analysis. So we focused the Recovery Act dollars, and I think it was close to $300 million, on energy storage demonstration projects, hoping to, to really push the technology and some of the analytics around the technology to the next level. Now I'm hoping what that will do will give us some of the parameters that we can say, okay, what is that gap analysis from the pinch points to say how do we reinvest that in materials development? I'd like to say we could do more in this area, and we should do more in this area from materials. There's a lot of innovation. I know I was talking to a couple people on chemistries, from flow batteries. I think there is a lot of opportunity. The RPE program is also looking at some advanced chemistry. So hopefully we can get some other funding lines and some other opportunities in that area. So. Uh, without necessarily being stuck on where costs are projected to be right now, what is the target, the moving target for storage pricing per kilowatt hour and also performance characteristics in terms of kilowatt delivery uh, over the next several years in order to unleash the market forces for renewable energy and in order to unleash the potential of the smart grid? What would the target be? Uh, just in terms of that's what we really need to do if we can do it. Well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll turn that over to you all to help me define, but in general, I think what you're hearing is the comparison of energy storage to fast ramping gas turbines, and so that becomes the comparison uh, for certain applications, whether you're talking ramping services, and some AGCs, because gas turbines can only follow this AGC signal so far, and then energy storage provides an additional value. But right now, energy storage is being compared to basically the application of gas turbines for, for that, that type of service. Uh, 
In other areas, you know, from a capital cost, you know, LCC, I put some numbers up there, but where do we need to be? I'm not sure if I can give you, you know, the exact number of where where the technology should go. I, but I can tell you. You got feel. Well, I'll let the experts give their gut feel. <laughs> Hi, Christine Herzog, um, the Managing Director of the Smart Grid Library, and my question is uh, focused on finance. In terms of the uh, Master Limited Partnerships, as they're currently structured, they're only really available for fossil fuels, and of course Chris Coons is uh, trying to change that with the NLP Parity Act. Has there been any conversation in Washington about possibly expanding that at some point in time to include energy storage and not just energy generation? You know, I would like to talk to you about that later because I'm not as familiar with the, the Master Limited Partnerships. It, it, I know that Dr. Meniz spoke about that as an, as an opportunity for a financing mechanism. I'm not from the financial side of the house. So I think the door is open for a, a wide variety of mechanisms and the energy storage community should look at all those different types of financing mechanisms, not only just uh, demonstration projects which you know had traditionally been the department's way of helping from a volume cost reduction point of view is doing demonstration projects but I think we need to be open the door to the other financing next opportunities are out there you spoke eloquently about uh, the challenge of valuing resilience uh, in light of Hurricane Sandy there's an irony here that the resilience is needed in part because of the GHG emissions of electric utilities. What about advocacy within the administration for a carbon tax specifically as a resilience measure? I, I don't... <laughs> at, at this stage in the game, I'm not aware of any administration effort on a, on a carbon tax. Of course you're not. That's the question. <laughs> So I think as we move forward, it, it is a mechanism among other mechanisms, but I'm not gonna, I can't, I can't give you a, a position one way or the other, because right now it's just, it's not, it's not being, it's not being proposed or discussed. Again, I, I bring the question because of your focus on resilience. Thank you. Okay. I think somebody mentioned earlier that US is number six or seven in terms of storage technologies. And I look around, and I at least count eight or nine or 10 companies out here who are really pioneers in energy technology development, storage technology development. So the issue is not that there's no enough development R&D happening in the USA. What's happening is the later stage, you see what happened to Prudent, or what happened to the VRB. So what you are showing in your graph, later stage loan guarantees. Now the problem is because of Solyndra, and A123, and Beacon, is that option totally off the table now? So how do you solve the problem? The problem is not developing technology here. The problem is keeping it here. And some of the mechanisms which were there seems to be disappearing. So what's the solution? You're very insightful on that because that is, I think, where some of the challenges are, is that we have at least a strong effort that's pulled together the developers and looking at cost reduction and looking at technology development. But it's how do you get it out there? Now, each of those uh, you know, efforts that you mentioned had you know, particularities among each of them you know, that, that surround, surrounds the conversation. But I think it goes down to how do you align the policies and the markets so that the development, manufacturing, and demonstration of energy storage can keep par with the needs? And so how do we continue to grow the market opportunity? And I think that's what you know, the chairman and the PUC commissioners are trying to do. But we have to be very careful that we continue to um, develop the technology and manufacture the technology in parallel to what the demand is requiring. And so we've got to make sure that we pace that um, in very close synchronization. Hello, William Tudor from uh, Sea Wave Battery, which is a saline battery that won't start on fire. 
and has a, a very high density compared to previous ones. But my question is not about that. It seems the eight countries that are leading us really have no fossil fuels. So the problem is the fossil fuels dominate and batteries will be second. And I don't have a solution for that, do you? I don't, well, I, I think I spent three quarters of my talk talking about how do we optimize the portfolio and look at the balance between, you know, utilizing different generation technologies. For us, that solution set is going to come in that optimization. Although we have natural gas, we don't have it everywhere. And if you look at, and I have a diversity of generation, it's an EEI chart. Uh, that looks at uh, different generation mixes across the United States from coal to renewables and how the portfolio changes depending on the region of the country you're in. And I think as we continue to look at policies, as we look at a quadrennial energy review of where do we want to head for a clean energy future, you're going to see some shifting. And that the interesting thing that we're trying to look at is can you build the infrastructure, i.e. transmission lines, and natural gas infrastructure, i.e. pipelines, to keep pace with the system requirements. And I think that was teased out a little bit in the earlier conversation is that we might have a timing issue here on seeing what we can build and how fast can we build it. And there are limitations to how fast some of the technologies, i.e. robustness, building transmission, or, or natural gas infrastructure can be built. Hey, Pat. Um, Rick Winter from Uni Energy Technologies. There seems to be a very uh, a great commonality of purpose between your office, office of Electricity and the Department of Defense in terms of uh, renewable penetration and how to accept that into, quite frankly, microgrids for operating bases. Yes. Can you describe a little bit about your plans or existing plans and future plans about working together with the DOD? So where our role in the activities that we've been doing with the Department of Energy, uh, with the Department of Defense is actually we're helping them with design studies. So, and we're hoping we actually can do this, the same thing at the community level. But really taking a look at their demand and their demand profile, their RPS requirements, their basically very locational uh, resources that are available, and saying, okay, what you know, what is uh, your performance targets or your goals with respect to reliability, availability, and saying how one would design a distribution system that provides some robust robustness, but uh, I would say more of uh, a diversity of technology so that they can look at, well, if this technology is out, how do we look at demand response or use of renewables or use of natural gas to optimize their portfolio? But their optimization may be more of a resiliency bent than a cost bent. Whereas if you looked at and tried to do the scenario, say, in, in one of the New Jersey communities, they may look at cost effectiveness and resiliency. So what we're doing is doing some optimization studies and trying to define what is an optimal performance of their distribution system and how can they utilize in size their renewable technologies because we, we can we can go for the largest size that's available but if their demand profile is of such that might need a battery system that comes and just flows it out of the park so what we're trying to do is say all right let's let's really look at an optimization and from a resiliency point of view how do you pull together the synergies between natural gas and renewables Hi, uh, Craig Horn, CEO, co-founder of Intervault Corporation. So I want to thank you again for the uh, support from the uh, Office of Energy on our RS storage demonstration project. And regarding the discussion a moment ago about uh, new technologies, I want to uh, laud the program because what it's done for Intervault is uh, we're in the process now of delivering a, uh, a one megawatt hour system to the field. And it'll be the largest iron chrome redox flow battery in the world when this is done later on this year. And by going to that kind of demonstration level for this project, it's not only forces to develop the technology, but also the supply chain behind it. And think about ways that are not only technology solutions in the lab, but things that can actually scale. And so it's been a very valuable experience forcing the engineering team to work closely with our operations team to come up with these viable solutions. It given us visibility as how the supply chain would scale 
up to levels of one gigawatt to six gigawatt hours. And in some sense, it seems like that's a lot of capacity, six gigawatt hours. But if you look at it in comparison, that's uh, one, the output of one large scale lithium ion plant uh, uh, in, in today's world. So this is kind of scale we have to get up to. And, and the program was great at, uh, at, at getting us to that point. Um, the question I actually had, though, was um, at the beginning, uh, the first slide you had, you mentioned drivers uh, uh, for the transformation of the grid. And, and one of them, time of use rates and load management, I think you've spoken a little bit behind the drivers behind some of them, but if you could talk about where you see the end point of that, what kind of time of use rates will uh, evolve over the next several years and, and, and the types of load management and magnitudes that will be informative. So, so when I talk about kind of the, the success points of the smart grid and in the stages of development, the early success points have been outage management systems, peak load reduction. Uh, you know, the next stage of where we're looking at benefits and value is asset management, predictive failure of equipment from a utilities point of view. The, the third benefit stream or, or opportunity is on the customer side. And I, and I usually say that's taking longer to develop. Um, primarily because of some of the time of use and discussions around what type of rate design is optimal for the customers. And there is great debate in the different pilots, so I've been advising that pilot programs should be done for effectiveness. But the design of the pilot program for time of use um, or real time uh, you know, rate structures has to marry what you hope to achieve. So for example, some communities really want to pull peak load reduction on the system. So they may look at a critical peak pricing or variable peak pricing program to pull that down and find that to be very effective in what they hope to achieve. Other country or other entities, state entities are looking at the rollout of electric vehicles. Well, with the advent of the electric vehicles and the rollout, and as it gets to grid support, and we talk about five minute intervals you are going to get closer and closer to the need for deployment of s some real-time rate structures from a vehicle point of view if you're going to look at that demand or that use of the electric vehicle as support to the electric system so you may see multi you may see a different rate design for vehicles or you may see the growing and the evolution to real-time real-time rates but it goes back to that the role help out has to be from the utility commission has to be very clear in what they hope to achieve as they look at the market opportunities. I think the California, Hawaii, where they're really, really going and advancing from an electric vehicle point of view, you're going to see more and more you know, real-time structures, whereas other areas of the country where they just have a, you know, a peaking issue that they want to defer, like OG&E uh, wants to defer the building of a power plant, and so they just want to pull their peak down off their system. So I think that's going to evolve over time, but what that's going to do as we look at applications is say customer, the customer, uh, the demand response, the elasticity of demand is going to have a stronger and stronger role as we talk about managing the electric grid. And there is a huge opportunity there, but it's still an evolution that's kind of coming into play. So we're actually out of time for questions. So if you all join me in thanking Assistant Secretary Hoffman. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Joshua Bardlev is a regulatory affairs consultant and the former VP of Bright Source Energy. He'll be providing us with a California Energy Storage Policy Briefing. Okay, I hope uh, I'm not going to have any technical issues. Um, I'm, um, I'm here on behalf of uh, CESA because for several years now I, I have been helping, advising a great client, uh, Primus, located uh, right across uh, the San Mateo Bridge Commissioner Peterman, right over there, 30 people working. It's a great company as it and in its efforts to navigate the challenging parallel long roads of technology, regulatory policy, and market 
seeking. But I'm also here speaking as a veteran of 37 years uh, in the California energy business. And in that business, I've been on the front lines of LNG, gas deregulation, electric deregulation, uh, energy crisis, utility bankruptcy, uh, market manipulation, um, pioneer renewable companies like Luz, uh, the first large-scale solar energy company, pioneer advocacy groups like CERT, which Ralph Cavana and I and John White organized in, I think, 1990, three of us. Um, the Tug Group in D.C., none of you will remember that, but that was the beginning of the transmission unbundling effort. Um, so I, I'd like to reflect a little on whether policies are working and, um, and also lessons to be learned. At times I'm optimistic um, about our future um, and just as often frustrated and pessimistic. Um, and I guess I'm probably, I'm going to try to ask you guys the questions about whether all of this is working. Uh, because none of us have all the answers. Um, uh, not, not the regulatory agencies, not the venture capital firms. Um, we're all looking for the answer. My focus is on policy, but my policy question is in the context of what I think is, is an existential challenge in our time that makes this, these times different than other times. After all, if all we were talking about here is a new app um, uh, for the market, what we'd be seeing is the market determining the price and the demand for that. But instead, we're facing a very serious existential challenge, and every day, uh, today on the news as well, uh, the prediction of hurricanes for this coming season, the, the news is getting quite serious. The melting of ice is more rapid than people thought. The news, if anything, is worse. And so this is not an ordinary challenge. This is not like deregulation. This is climate change. And if climate change is your barometer, if climate change is what you're trying to solve here over decades and decades, um, then, then it's a different question. Um, and it's, it's so different that the problem, and I'm just going to tell you my headline ahead of time, is that we keep evaluating all our new widgets in a very, it, with, with an expectation that they develop very quickly and that they meet a market competition test. And that market competition test is to compete with industries that have been subsidized for decades, have had decades to control infrastructure and control the rules of the infrastructure. For example, 36 balancing, the 37 balancing authorities in the West, which act as gatekeepers uh, to competition. And I could go on and on and on, and I have. That was my, that's been my experience. And so generally what I've seen is that policy makers have generally failed to emulate the market. And with an existential challenge before us, it's really a question uh, whether they're up to the task. And um, I'm, I don't want to sound, I'm already sounding like a pessimist, um, but I'm not because I believe that on the positive side, we have all the technology, we have the technologies, we have the answers. What we need is create markets and opportunities for those. And we need to do it way more rapidly than what we're doing right now. So let me talk a little bit about CESA, the organization that asked me to speak here. Forget about my biography. Oh, have to go the other way. Sorry, but I want everyone to focus on those two or three last sentences, actually. I'm glad I was able to put that up there. So, CESA, like, uh, has many members and with a variety of, very wide variety of technologies, ranging uh, from early startups to established companies, 
and like other renewable uh, technology associations, it's seeking tangible market results, real markets, uh, and it believes that it is, and it is, uh, supporting renewable energy, uh, helping it to integrate and to firm up, and it believes in coalition building with lots of stakeholders. Um, and the, the key to both success and failure with organizations like CESA is that it can't cover all fronts. One of my disappointments uh, in this industry from the beginning is the fact that it's, uh, it's so diversified that it doesn't seem to have the ability to combine forces. Uh, you'll see 25 different briefs being filed at every one of these in every one of these proceedings. Everyone's got their little angle, and all these little angles are actually undermining uh, the overall effort, which is to create a large market in a short amount of time. So, um, I'm telling you some of my biases. Um, hello. Now, um, as Commissioner Wellinghoff said before, uh, this was a study that he was pointing to by Sandia, which shows a tremendous uh, potential for various applications of storage with a huge amount of value. Uh, we also know, and this is another truism in my opinion, that while some of the circles up here are larger than other circles, the value proposition actually changes. We're not going to know all the answers. Something that may look like it has tremendous cost-benefit today in the market is going to turn out to be uh, not as cost-beneficial, while others that look like they were minor players become larger players. And so we need to keep room for the various uh, applications. We need to make room to advance all of them. You've seen these charts as well. Uh, the signs are encouraging for, elect for electric storage. Factors such as the, 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 the factor that uh, Karen talked about earlier, the load shift um, a profile, uh, the load resulting from electric vehicles, um, rising energy prices, the variability of renewables, and the fact is the policymakers, um, uh, particularly here in California uh, and at FERC, uh, are responding, uh, and that's part of the good news. But this is the challenge that I had in the solar business, and one that is probably not that far off from what you're going to have. And I'm acknowledging my colleague in the audience, Arthur, uh, who we work together at Bright Source, so we developed this ridiculous looking chart. But, but it's true. Uh, this is the everyday challenge that one has to bring along a renewable energy project. These are the kind of challenges that you're going to have. Just take a look for a moment at this chart. Look at all the agencies you have to go to. Look at all the congressional challenges you have. Look at all the FERC challenges. Look at all the states that you're trying to market it. And that was solar energy. That was large-scale solar energy. Um, but believe me, when you get down to it for storage, it's not going to be that different. And I'm going to get back to that theme again. This is a very long road. It's a road that venture capital firms, and how many are there in this audience that represent venture, represent that you generally have not been conditioned to, to live in this long road world. You're expecting the, the app to get on the market and to be bought by the market with a price to be determined by the market. And that's not what goes on here. One needs a tremendous amount of focus and patience. One also needs to combine with others who are somewhat sympathetic and make an overall effort, and that has not been happening. These are the kind of steps, and they're not necessarily in order. It's just sort of a recreation of the previous chart. Um, uh, each of these takes time. And one of the questions I would ask you is, if, how long should this take? Given the existential challenge that we have, how long should this take? How long before we have a healthy set of companies with a wide variety of widgets that are uh, that, that are tested in the marketplace, 
that find out who is winning and losing and determining what fixes need to be made for the next widget. How long should this take? How long do we take for this? 15 years? Three years? How long a patient's factor do the venture capital firms have? How long are they supposed to wait? Ten years. Ten years, actually that's longer than what I thought I was going to hear. <laughs> but I'm glad to hear you shout out an answer. These, uh, and you know, what makes the, the challenge very challenging and complicated for uh, storage uh, is that it does have a lot of applications. Um, and with all those applications, um, there are a lot of rules. And what makes storage particularly challenging is the jurisdiction of each of those rules, ranging from all the way from your home to the, to, to the grid. And everyone is going to want to have a piece of that. Everyone's going to want to deliberate. And, you know, as a lawyer, I do believe in due process, but um, 10 years? Do we have 10 years? So, and the other complexity here is the different types of technologies with multiple applications. Put a jurisdictional overlay on those multiple applications. Ask yourself how many agencies are going to want a piece of that, are going to want to determine that. And this actually captures the different jurisdictions, the different revenue streams that can come from that, and the stacking that's possible that storage can provide, the stacking of services, but where that stacking of services is regulated by different agencies, all of whom have to somehow get there for a project. Get there at different times, taking different amount of times, um, and you can't really move forward. This is a, kind of the dilemma that we had with the Ivanpah project. We could have the CPUC approve our contracts one day, but the Energy Commission take three and a half years to provide final approvals for a project. Um, FERC could turn around for BrightSource and give it whatever approval it needed in, I think, 90 days. It, it's, it's like that, and you can't finance a project without needing all of these. So look at all these different revenue opportunities, look at the potential benefits, and then ask yourself really the, the legal question, um, which is, who's going to have jurisdiction over these? We're lucky to be living in California. California's got, and I know this from having worked many years in this business, California has the smartest, most courageous, most resourceful uh, legislators, agency heads, thinkers, labs, and as a result of this, we've had a very, very good start. Um, 2514, as Commissioner Peterman talked about before, um, is going well, quite well. Uh, SCHIP program, the RPS leg legislation, all of these that are listed here um, are really giving California a tremendous boost uh, for, for storage. Um, and I, I want to show you Later, I'm going to refer to this document, which just came out. I wish I had it in color so you could see it. It's the 2013 California Renewable Energy Innovation Index, which shows all the benefits that California is getting from this investment. It's a smart investment. And regulators and legislators are to be complimented for putting California on this road, and regulators should not be shirking from the challenges uh, that we are hearing these days. Too expensive, let's take a step back, has it been worth it? I don't know that in an existential challenge world we have much choice, by the way. I 
I really question whether the measurements we're using uh, are really the proper measurements in an existential challenge challenge. So what we're seeing in the 2514 context is really quite a good, quite a good progress. And the cost-benefit um, uh, preliminary results are, are, are five minutes, but I started like 10 minutes late. So I'm going to go where I need to go here. Um, so this is the this is a time frame, and I think again it's going to go well. From my perspective, the question is what happens after. This proceeding is going well. It's been very orderly, very calm, intellectual, great discourse. Um, we've also had another decision. Um, in the LTPP phase one decision that you could see up there that where uh, the commissioners took a very, very courageous step forward. Uh, Commissioner Florio uh, said what I sort of say all the time, which is we need to move beyond paralysis by analysis with respect to energy storage. And I would say every one of our renewable challenges falls into that. We need to move faster. Uh, we've had very, very good early success with the S-CHIP program, um, and um, we're getting a lot of we're getting a lot of projects. Um, and if I move on to if I move on to this, I have no doubt that renewable energy costs are going to come down over time. I have no doubt that over time everyone is going to see the value of storage that in this climate change constrained world people are going to realize that storage is going to be quite valuable so what is it that I'm unhappy about <laughs> the good news is that we are on a path that has had notable success Second, the good news is that we have the most enlightened, progressive, and brave policymakers right here in California. And the third good piece of news is that we have tremendous technologies that can address climate change in a relatively short amount of time, I believe. I certainly believe that about large-scale solar. Um, I. I know that it's true of other technologies as well. And the challenges, the challenges that Karen talked about before to blend, to integrate these, are completely solvable. And I also know, based on this index, this document that you all ought to be looking at on the web, that this has been good for the economy, for jobs, for emissions, for health, um, for um, patents that are emanating out of California companies. Um, that's all the good news. Now the bad news. The bad news is that I think that right now climate change is winning. Um, do I know that as a scientist? No. What I do know is that this is a very long road and it's taking too long to bring these technologies to the market. And from the point of view of a venture capitalist, the valley of death in this country is way too long. Um, we, we can't expect financial investments to keep being made in new technologies when it takes 10 years just it just doesn't work that way and all the others on the other side have got gazillion dollars in capital all ready to go to maintain their hold on the market so you really have to sort of say thank you venture capital firms thank you Silicon Valley for putting money into us when do you want your payback 10 years how much of a payback don't know the market is capped the price is capped I've got to compete with natural gas. It goes up and down. What am I going to do? 
please tell me some kind of a mark. When do I get to charge market price? When do I get my permits? That's what a venture capital firm is going to ask. And the, it's very difficult to kind of come back with answers to that. So here's the next piece of bad news. California is pretty much the only market, as I learned from going state to state to state to state. Guys, this is only basically happening in California. And I completely understand why policymakers are kind of saying, hold on a minute, we expected the other guys to kind of go along with us to create other markets. But they're not. Because ultimately it comes down to creating a national set of requirements, a clean energy standard, um, a carbon tax, a carbon market it isn't Quebec and California, which is what it is right now, but in fact a broad, wide market where you can really do some trading. An imbalanced market that breaks through barriers. All these are going to require national uh, initiatives. And on the pessimistic side, you'll forgive me, you know, when I see how difficult it's been to get transmission built, uh, to get permitting done. Um, when I see incentives like the investment tax credit that only lasts for a few years and in the scheme of things to, to have it expire in just two more years or three more years given the amount of time you need, given the lack of a, an ITC for batteries, for storage, um, it's a pretty dismal future, particularly dismal near-term future, particularly when you look at uh, the end of 2016, when a lot of these are going to expire, including the property tax exemption for solar that I was so proud to get a few years ago. Um, so the, the news is good in California. The news is not particularly good um, outside. And I would say the next piece of bad news and I guess I would level a little bit of criticism at California for this, is that we don't really have a multi-year roadmap. We have a number of proceedings in California. Sometimes it's hard to figure out how they even relate to each other. Resource adequacy, um, capacity, uh, you know, the, the flexible capacity markets, um, the RPS, the RFOs, the RAM, the FIT, all these different ones. And what I see is that none of them are being compared to a dashboard. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a 2050 dashboard. I'd like to see a dashboard that sort of says, here's how we're doing to accomplish our 2050 80% reduction. Here's how we're doing. And here's how we're doing. And your particular proceeding needs to make sure that it's compared to that. That's the dashboard. How is your proceeding going to shape that so that when you go out for an RFO, what's it doing to emissions? When you uh, decide that you're going to keep these once through cooling units alive for another, I don't know how many more years, what's it going to do to that dashboard? And I don't see that. I would like to see that in California. I'd like, you know, in, in, when I was just coming out of law school, we, used to, we had the, the environmental impact statement. I don't see that when it comes to climate change impact in California, and I'd like to see that. Um, our policies take too long to develop. Look at the feed-in tariff. Look how long it's taken. And that is a fantastic incubation policy. It's just taking too long. RAM has been, a, the RAM uh, bidding program has been really good and is developing lower prices. Um, but it takes too long and there isn't enough of a market for it. And that's my next recommendation. You need to develop, I think California needs to develop real incubation markets I don't know that we should even call it incubation, but it needs to create enough markets. If I were, if, if what I hope comes out of 2514 is, yes, these following applications have the potential to be cost beneficial, yes. Now, we need to make sure that there are now enough opportunities for companies out there to either 
uh, contract with the utilities or to have the utilities buy their systems and rate base them. And we will, we will allow you to rate base it utilities, even if it is a little bit more expensive, but we want a sizable amount. I'm not going to tell you how many megawatts it should be. What I do know is that the feed-in tariff is, uh, is too small, the RAM is too small. For a state that is facing an existential challenge, we need to create larger incubation markets. And we need to make sure that every one of these proceedings is comparing the results of that proceeding to a, a let's call it an emissions or you know it, it'll be a complicated dashboard but it is a dashboard look at this study that I waved to you before so I'll throw out just a couple more um, recommendations from a guy who's a lot older than most people here in this room one is that I don't see that we have any choice but to start seeing the RPS as an 80 percent RPS not a 33 percent RPS and to base all of our policies on that. That'll create a market, by the way. Um, I've already talked about the incubation faster and more. I think we need to start getting done with our proceedings more quickly. Um, we need to really focus on the federal government, and I'm going to come back at, at the end to the politics of this. Focus on the Fed in terms of tax credits, MLP reforms an infrastructure bank to make it possible to finance these projects um, and to have these impact statements. I'm, I want to just kind of end it with the, the biggest lesson of my career was actually in 2010 when the Republicans took back the House. And what you saw, and I'm aiming this right at you guys who live in Silicon Valley, was a running to the hills like you cannot believe. The moment that the Chamber of Commerce and the oil companies sort of said, no, don't have, don't have room for that subsidy, but please keep going with our subsidies. We didn't even hear from Silicon Valley. Those of us who went to Washington, where were you guys? Why weren't you lobbying? Why weren't the environmental organizations combining and lobbying hard on an RPS? Why wasn't solar and wind and storage and everybody else combining in one big meeting with the key senators instead of arguing with each other all the time? And that's what I see in this industry. That is a hallmark of this industry. You all go and get your own lawyers for your own particular technologies and get your own lobbyists and the in environmental organizations hardly ever find an individual project that they like. There's always something wrong with it. And no one is kind of looking at the kind of fight that we've got. And the fight we've got is hardball baseball like you've never seen. You have to be prepared to fight very hard in the next few years. And you can do it, but you need to combine. And you need to look beyond your individual interests. And that's how we win this climate change war. Thank you. that big picture perspective of California and um, with that I would like to invite you all to join us for lunch. Lunch will be served um, actually you're going to be routed around in a circle here around the corner and back through the buffet line and then you can take your lunches